or listen to the honeybees and the buckwheat. We had a, an orchard on a part of our acre, and we had buckwheat that stood that high among those trees. And they, the bees just loved it. And it was interesting to listen to them, to be quiet and to think. We found a place along the St. Lawrence when we were in Eastern Ontario where we could watch the ships from other countries go by. Upstream into the Great Lakes and downstream back into the ocean, taking cargo in and cargo out. And it was always nice to go to our cottage when we had it up on the, the mighty river that nearly dried up every summer. But to get right up against the cottage, which is 75 feet away from its banks in the springtime. It was as if I was in a different world. All the troubles, I could feel them, float away. A weight coming off my shoulders. Time of part. We need those places of quiet rest to sense the presence of God. A deacon's retreat. Many of those deacons at that retreat on their evaluation form ticked off the, the point that they found their quiet time was one of the things they enjoyed each morning. Some of them indicated that it was the first quiet time they had had for months or years. We all need some quiet time. Time to look up. Time to listen. Time to wait for God to speak. The disciples' experience was so marvelous on that mountaintop that they decided they wanted to make it their permanent residence. Peter said, oh Lord, this has been a wonderful experience. We have never had anything like this ever before. Let's build three tabernacles so that we can have some place to be permanent. Some way to make this a permanent residence for us. They wanted to hold on to that experience to make it immortal in some way. And we all know the danger. We may have been at a retreat or some other place where everything was wonderful. We've had a, an inspiring experience and now we expect that every other experience of worship in our life is just like that one. And it's never going to change. We can't let go of that experience. We can't put it in the past. We now judge everything by that one experience. We want to lounge on the altar, or we may want to hold on to another experience. We have difficulty adjusting because we want to hang on. Our past memories of worship are there to help us, we think, prolong what we once had. There is always a danger that we will try to build tabernacles and rest on past progress or experiences. Let's stop and build, we say. But Jesus says, move on. Down off the mountain, my friends. Down into the valley. That's where life is. That's where you need to be. Yes, Jesus calls us to take time to look up, time to meditate, time to be silent and listen for what God has to say. But we also have to look around us and respond to the needs of others. So find time to meditate. Look around you. See the human needs that are there. Then arise from your meditation and look to Jesus for direction in your life. That's the assurance we have for all of us. Look ahead. No matter what is in front of us, God is already there. 
God is there to help us, to guide us along life's paths. Let us see only Jesus as our guiding light. The transfiguration was a frightening experience for the disciples. They didn't know what to make of it. But after they heard the voice from the cloud, they were terrified. And they looked and they saw Jesus, and only Jesus. Moses and Elijah were gone. The truth is a central thrust of the New Testament. Jesus is the focus of God's revelation to us, for us, in us. Christ is the center of our proclamation. He is the central focus of the Christian faith. He is the one through whom we see God. We don't have merely a philosophy or a system about God. We focus on what God has done in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Our primary focus is in our faith. It is not on what we believe, but in whom we believe. We don't focus on a structure or a system of rituals. You and I have committed our faith in allegiance to a person, Jesus Christ. The disciples could have gone away seeing only Moses. They could have been convinced, as many are, that the law is the principal guidance for life. Others may have gone away seeing just Elijah, the prophet. And these would have believed that the basic answer is revolution and change. Both of these are important. The law is important for guiding us to the truth that Christ is God's Son. And through Him, we can see the Father. Revolution and change? Yes. The Spirit calls us to be <coughs> in the world. The world is not static. The world is changing. And we must bring the gospel message to a changing world. We must adapt our message to meet the needs of people. Not to water it down, not to adjust it so the truth is missing, but to bring that truth as simply as we can. There are times that we need to hear the words of the law and the commands, and there are other times when we need to hear the words of prophecy, revolution, and change. With Jesus Christ as our central focus, however, we hear those essential strains. But we also know that there are times to hear the words of comfort, of support, of encouragement, hope, forgiveness, salvation. When we focus on Jesus Christ as Lord, this central figure guides in a way that is essential for us in that moment. How Jesus was transfigured on the mountaintop below him in the valley were the other disciples. A father had brought his son, who was an epileptic, asking the disciples to heal his son. You have been with the Master. You have seen him heal. I know that you have healed. Heal my son. But they could not do it. Try as they might, they could not heal that boy. In 1520, Raphael painted his last great work. The painting is a picture of Jesus transfigured on the mountain, and the disciples are seen down below. The main picture, Jesus on the mountain, and down in the corner, there are the disciples down below in the valley, trying to heal <clears throat> that boy. The boy has his hand raised up toward where Jesus is. Looking to Jesus for help. You could almost hear him calling out. 
Jesus told Peter, James, and John that they could not stay sitting on top of the world. You can't stay here, boys. We've got to go down. We are isolated from human need up here. We have to go down the mountain, back into the valley, where the people are, where the need is. You are called to meet their needs. We have to walk down into the valleys of life ourselves. Minister to the persons who have genuine needs. Minister was driving a parishioner away from the funeral home, having made arrangements for his wife's funeral. The passenger was a retired man, an elder in the church. And as they were going along, they were talking about the community and the people in it. And the minister happened to mention another man in a town just a short distance away. And how he had also lost his wife. He was going through the same experience that this man was. The man said, oh yes, I remember Joe. I must go see him soon and talk with him. In the midst of his own grief, he was going to comfort another. I watched my mother comfort a woman whose mind was not all there. She was looking for her daughter who died many years before as a young girl. My mother, still able to get out of her hospital bed, at that time about a month and a half away from dying herself, went to this woman, put her arm around her shoulder and said, it's all right Mary, don't worry. Why did the woman got back into her own bed? We need to look up and sense the presence of God in our worship. We need to know for certain. And we can. We look up to Him for a presence to sustain us each and every day. Then we look down to the needs of those around us who are hurting. We have been called to minister to hurting humanity around us. Then look ahead to the Christ who is calling you to follow Him wherever He leads. Remember, He's already there, ready to sustain you. He is the one that we need to keep our eyes on always.